Hey there everybody, Mr. Mark here again. In this video, we're going to discuss wave diffraction. Wave diffraction is a phenomenon that is um, unique to waves. Particles do not do this. Um, and what basically wave diffraction is, is when a wave encounters an opening in a barrier, like a door in a wall for example, it will bend as it passes through the opening. This bending is called diffraction. So a real simple, typical picture looks something like this. Here is a wall or barrier of some kind with an opening in the middle of it. There's the opening. Here come some waves. And basically what we're looking at is we're looking at a top view of the waves, like we're looking at just the wave crests. And they're moving to the right. And as they go through the opening, they bend into more of a spherical shape. Um, and so we say that the waves have been diffracted. So diffraction can also occur just at the edge of a barrier. So that might look something like this. There are incident waves. And then as they're diffracted, just that edge, like right over here, bends a little bit into that spherical shape again. Um, and so that's the two basic ways we may see diffraction. So here's a really good picture of water waves being diffracted. You can kind of see on the right bottom corner that the waves are making like lines. And then as they go through the space between the rocks, they're making more of a curved pattern. And so we're seeing the water waves being diffracted through the opening in those rocks. If you look closer, you can see that it's also occurring to the left of that left rock, just kind of out of the shot of the picture. And you can kind of see some areas where the waves aren't as easy to see, which would indicate that the waves are interfering with each other. And so you can see an interference pattern if you look at that kind of closely. So it's a really good illustration, um, and one that we're kind of going to think of about later. So the next question is, when does this diffraction thing occur? Because it doesn't always occur for every wave, for every opening. So diffraction occurs if the size of the opening itself is about on the same level, same size, as the wavelength of the wave. So let me give you a couple of pictures. The picture on the left has the opening, which is much larger than the wavelength of the wave. And the picture on the right has an opening, which is about the same size as the wavelength of the wave. And so on the left side, the wavelength is much smaller than the opening, so you don't see that real spherical pattern. You see a little bit of bending around the edges, but the middle is still basically straight. Whereas on the right picture, the wavelength is about the same size as the opening, and so we get that good spherical diffraction pattern. And so the thing to remember is that the size of the opening has to be about the same size as the wavelength of the wave. That's the thing we need to remember. So a couple of examples of um, diffraction in everyday life. Um, sound waves can diffract through open doors. And the reason that it can diffract through open doors is because a door is about a meter wide and sound waves are about a meter in wavelength. And so sound waves will diffract through an open door. So if somebody's standing out in the hallway um, of the school building with the door open, you may not be able to see them, but you will hear them because the sound can diffract through the door. Radio waves can diffract around hills and other big barriers. Radio waves are pretty big in wavelength, so a picture might look something like that. Some radio waves are so big that they'll actually diffract around the Earth itself. And these are waves that you can like hear long, long, long ways away. A third example, if you try to take a picture with a camera, inside the camera is a little tiny opening called an aperture, and light will diffract through the aperture of the camera. So using different size apertures, you can get different quality and effects to a photograph um, and kind of change the way that it looks, just by changing the way light diffracts as it goes through that opening. So next thing, can we explain why diffraction occurs? What's causing this diffraction? So the best way to think about this is to consider all the points along those waves, so every single point along there, as being a point source to create new waves. 
So a point source is kind of like something, it just sounds like it sounds like, uh, it's something that is a point that creates waves. So it's kind of like dipping a pencil into a bowl of water. You get spherical waves when you do that. As opposed to a plane source, which would be like dipping a ruler into a dish of water. So here is our plane wave moving to the right. Um, and we're going to assume that it extends all the way to the edge of the medium. So we're not going to worry about the edges. They don't do anything special. And I'm just going to kind of designate four dots on that wave, four points. And so what this idea says is that we're going to consider each of those four points to be a source that creates waves. And so my dashed lines represent troughs, and my solid lines represent crests. And so if I draw four of them, it might look something like that. So what's going to happen is because those point sources are creating waves which spread out in the spherical pattern, is that they're going to interfere with each other. Some points, the crests and the troughs, will be lined up, like right here, for example. And sometimes the crests and the crests will be lined up, like right here, for example. And so the net effect of that is that you just get another flat line because the left and right parts of the waves sort of balance each other out. So again, the net effect is just you get a straight line. Unless something is blocking one of those point sources. So here's our wave again, but this time it's being blocked in the middle by a barrier. And so the same effect, or same thing, same starting point, um, each of those four point sources act like a um, spherical wave source, except those two in the middle are blocked. And so we won't get any interference from the middle like we did before. So now there's no interference like right around here, and so that spherical shape actually gets through. We don't get that line created by interference. So this idea was first propositioned by a guy by the name of Christian Huygens. And so in his honor, this principle is referred to as Huygens' principle. The idea that every point on a wavefront acts like a point source. And we're actually going to use this to um, think about a couple other different wave phenomenons in the future. So here's kind of a better picture, more professionally drawn than what I can draw. So if we look at the picture on the left... Each of these represents a point on the wave, considered to be a point source. And so the net effect of all those things interfering is that you get a plane wave instead. If instead we were to block part of it, then we would see the spherical wave, because there wouldn't be anything below or above it to interfere with to create the line wave, the plane wave. Yet a better diagram would probably look something like that. So the white lines in this situation represent the crests. The black lines represent the troughs. And so if you kind of make like a little line right here, you can see that you've got white lines overlapping with white lines. And so that's the front that you see, the plane that you see. Over more in this area, you don't see that happening. And so in that area, the resulting wave is spherical instead of linear. So it's kind of hard to see, but this light gray line right here represents the net effect. And that's kind of like the pictures we've seen so far. Okay, so why is this diffraction thing important, other than just cool to bend waves? Um, this character by the name of Thomas Young, in the year 1900, performed an experiment, and the purpose of his experiment was to see if light behaved as a wave. And so what he did was he took a card, it was like an index card we would have today, and he took a razor blade and he cut two very narrow slits in the card. And then he shined light on there, and again he was trying to see if light behaves as a wave or as a particle. And so we refer to this as Young's double slit experiment, because he cut two slits in the card. And we'll see why there were two here in just a second. So here are two slits. So we're looking at the card from the side, kind of like a cross section. And then back behind there we have a screen or something that we can use to see what actually happens. 
and then here's a monochromatic light source. Um, today we would use like a laser to get a monochromatic light source. Monochromatic just means one wavelength. It's like red, the single wavelength. So there's two possible outcomes. If light acts like a particle, then particles of light will simply go through the two slits and will get collected on the screen. We'll see two bright spots. If, however, light acts like a wave, here comes a wave front, the wave will be diffracted through both slits, so we'll have two diffraction sources. And so we'll have two waves that are traveling towards each other, and so we'll see interference. And we'll see some spots where there's constructive interference, some spots where there's destructive interference. And that should kind of um, alternate back and forth as we move up and down along the screen. We should see bright spot, dark spot, bright spot, dark spot, bright spot, dark spot, etc., etc. So if light is a particle, we would see two bright spots. If light is a wave, we would see several bright spots. And so here's a picture of what you actually get when you do that. And it should be pretty clear that you've got many bright spots, not just two. The middle bright spot is the brightest, and then as you move outwards from the middle one, here's the middle, so as you move outwards, they get less and less bright until eventually it will go away, but you can see many bright spots. And so what Mr. Young observed was that the wave behavior of light was being demonstrated. He had critical evidence here that light acts like a wave. So here's kind of a better illustration of that. Here are our two slits, there and there, and our waves that are diffracted as they go through the opening, and there will be regions of constructive interference, like right here, and regions of destructive interference right here. So on the screen, we see bright spots, and we see dark spots, and they kind of alternate in a repeating fashion. So more so than just demonstrating that light acted like a wave, this actually lets us measure the wavelength of light, which is something we could not do using any other means. So we've kind of drawn our picture a little bit bigger. There's our double slit. There's a screen on the right side. And what I'm going to do is instead of drawing both waves in their entirety, is I'm just going to take sketch one possible path each wave could take to the screen. So there's one in red from the top slit, one in blue from the bottom slit. Now let's suppose that on the screen we see a bright spot. The fancy physics term for that would be to say we see an interference maxima. So maxima is a term we need to know. The reason we would see a bright spot is because that's where we have a region of constructive interference. Which means that the two paths, the red and the blue paths, are an integer number of wavelengths, we might write that as m lambda, different from each other. So if we try to draw the wave, maybe the red wave looks like this, and if you count those waves, we've got one wave, two waves, and so I can say that the length of that path, which I'm going to call p1, is equal to two lambda, two wavelengths. If you draw the blue wave, it might look something like that. And then if you count the waves, we've got one wave, two waves, three waves. Ah, ah, ah. So I'm going to say that P2, the length of the blue path, is 3 lambda. And so if you notice the way I've drawn that, when we get to the end, we've got two troughs meeting up, which means we're going to see constructive interference. So the waves both end at a trough, or excuse me, a crest. And so since two crests are lined up, then we get constructive interference. Crest, trough, same thing. Let me fix that real quick. Okay, so the big idea here is that if the difference between those two paths is equal to some integer number of wavelengths, then we would see a maximum. I'm going to kind of draw this picture again. I'm going to draw a little bit different this time so that the paths are slightly different um, than they were before. 
And let's suppose on this screen we have a dark spot, which we might call an interference minimum. So minimum will be a term for where the screen is dark. That is the result of destructive interference. And so in order to get destructive interference, that means that the two paths, the red one and the blue one, have to be different by m plus or minus a half wavelength. So in other words, they need to be one half wavelength off from each other. So if the red wave looks like this, again, that would be two wavelengths. Now the blue wave may look like this. And so if we count the waves for the blue one, we would see it's one, two, and a half. So I'm going to say that P2 is two and a half lambda. So over here we have a crest and a trough meeting, which means we get destructive interference. So over here I've got a crest and a trough, and so we see a dark spot. And so the big idea here is that when P1 and P2 are different by m plus or minus a half lambda, then we see an interference minimum. I don't know why my minimum wrote weird like that. So here's kind of a better picture that a professional drew. If we go and we count the waves in the top picture, we would get three and a quarter wavelengths. And then for the other wave, we would get the same thing, three and a quarter waves. And so in that picture, at point C, we would get an interference maximum. On the bottom picture, the top waves would be two and three quarter wavelengths. You count those carefully. The bottom picture would still be three and a quarter wavelength. And that's exactly one half wavelength different, which means we would get an interference minimum. So in this picture, they've um, the professional who drew this illustrated it with speakers, but it works the same way for light being diffracted through a slit. We get interference, constructive interference, when the wavelengths are the same or whole number integers from each other. And we get destructive interference if they differ by some half number of wavelengths. Okay, so how do we actually use that to figure out the wavelength? So I'm going to kind of redraw my picture again. Um, and this time we're going to define a few things on our diagram. I'm going to say that the distance between the slits is D, D for distance. And I'm going to say that the red line is P1. And I'm going to say that this part of the blue line is P1 as well. And so those two red lines, P1, are both the same length, so I'm going to give them the same name. So what do I do with the rest of the blue line? Well, I'm going to call that delta P. That's the part that has to be M lambda wavelengths um, different from P1. So I get P2 by adding P1 and delta P. Delta P is the difference between the two. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a perpendicular bisector, basically a perpendicular line, from the top slit down to the blue line. That basically meets where P1 ends and delta P begins. So I made myself a groovy little right triangle. And so I'm going to define this angle at the top in orange, and then doing some simple trigonometry, I can say that the sine of that angle, the opposite side is the m lambda thing, that's delta p, and then the hypotenuse, which is opposite from the right angle, would be d. And so I've got a simple geometric relationship that relates the distance between the slits, which is something we could measure, to the wavelength. So the only thing we're missing there is the angle. So on the right side, I'm going to kind of draw a slightly different picture. I'm going to say that the card with the double slits in it is distance L from the screen, and that the distance to the bright spot is Y subscript M. I'll explain what the M means here in just a minute. And then this distance, the brown line, lets me define a similar right triangle. So if I take the triangle on the left, this guy right here, and I rotate it to the right, about you know, five-eighths of a turn, I guess, I don't know, then I would get this triangle right here, where this angle 
and this angle are the same. And so by doing that, I take this relationship for sine, for the sine of that angle, and I could write it in things of things, terms of things that are easier to measure. So I can say the tangent of that angle is equal to the opposite side, which is ym, over the adjacent side, which is L. And those, again, those two angles are the same. So y and l are easy to measure, d can be measured, and so from that we can get the angle and thus the wavelength. So combining those two relationships, I can use those two combine to get the wavelength of my light source. So what does the m thing represent? The m is the number of maxima counting from the center. So if m is 1, and that's the first bright spot above the center bright spot, so if I kind of sketch that out here, there's a center bright spot, there's the first bright spot, and then there's the second bright spot. And so Y subscript M, I would just be the distance to where M is the number of the maximum. So that distance will be Y1, that distance will be Y2. So that's just kind of a placeholder for the number of maximum from the center. This M would be the same thing. So if we're talking about the first maxima, then the m in my equation would just be 1. If we're talking about the second maxima, then right here for m I would plug in a 2. And that's all I gotta do. Count how many number of maxima I am from the center. Okay, so that was quite a bit. Uh, a lot of information, a lot of geometry. I'm not gonna really expect you to be able to do all that geometry, uh, but here's what I do expect you to know. I do expect you to know when diffraction occurs, the whole size of the opening being an important thing. I expect you to be able to explain why it, why it occurs, and that would be using Huygens principle. Huygens is just fun to say. Um, third thing, I expect you to be able to describe the double slit experiment, and then explain why it is important. Basically, it gives us um, evidence that light is a wave. The fourth thing that I expect you to be able to do is explain how the bright and dark spots are formed in the double slit experiment. We should be able to understand that whole constructive versus destructive interference thing and how it depends on the length of the path traveled. And then the fifth thing I expect you to be able to do is just given those two equations that I derived, use that to find the wavelength of a light source. So for example, next time in class I may hand you a laser and a card with slits cut in it and say hey take this and go measure the wavelength of this laser and that should take you about five minutes once you know all the things we learned today so I think that's enough learning for today we'll go ahead and call it an evening here um, we'll obviously work on this a little bit in class um, but do kind of review and check over those five things real quick before then I'll see you next time ta-ta